right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. What a terrific crowd. Uh, uh, for those of you that may not know me, I'm John Alger, president of James Madison University, and it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you here to this installment of the Madison Vision Series. As you probably know, many of you, how many of you have been to one of these before, one of the Madison? Great, great, a lot of hands. Uh, so most of you know then that through this series, we've been trying to elevate the discourse on our campus by bringing prominent thinkers and leaders on a variety of subjects who can help us to look at our current civic landscape from a variety of different perspectives and to think about what it means to be an engaged and enlightened citizen. So we talk about a lot of the big issues of the day and today we're in for a real treat. Today's lecture I think you will find will be unique certainly in the series and in true JMU spirit it's a collaborative effort. The Office of the President and Madison Institutes have been working closely with the steering committee for a major summit series that will be taking place on campus this week titled Cultivating the Globally Sustainable Self. I am very proud that our Madison Vision Series lecture today serves as a keynote address for that summit. So today we are in very good company by the way. We have people, how many of you are here for the summit? Can we see the hands? All right, a lot of hands. And how many of you are here from out of town? We have quite a few from out of town as well. Uh, so it's great to have uh, guests literally from ar around uh, the globe that are here for, for this summit series. And I want to extend a warm welcome to all of you, to our campus, as well as to our faculty and students, members of our local community who are here as well. It's great to have all of you with us to think about these issues together. And we are joined today, as I think most of you know, by Dr. Rianne Eisler, who's an internationally known scholar, writer, and social activist. Rianne, thank you so much for blessing us with your presence. This is quite a treat for all of us. Now, before we hear from Rianne, our keynote speaker, I want to introduce two colleagues here at the university, both of whom are on the steering committee for the summit series, and both of whom have had the privilege of knowing and working with Dr. Eisler in the past. Dr. Craig Sheely is a professor of graduate psychology and executive director of the International Beliefs and Values Institute, one of the conveners of the summit series that will be taking place over these next few days. And he will be joined by Dr. Teresa Harris, who is a professor of early education and is also managing director of that same institute. So now I'd like to turn things over to the two of them to offer uh, an additional perspective on our extraordinary keynote speaker, Dr. Rianne Eisler. Craig, Teresa, thank you so much. So uh, thank you, President Alger, um, and welcome everybody. Uh, it's wonderful to see a, a big crowd like this. Um, I hope you all come back tomorrow. Uh, for our panels, which will be here as well. It's an amazing group of people, and I thank all of them uh, for taking the trek. I just met Ron. I, I've known his work for many years, all the way from Australia. So come on back here tomorrow and uh, check out what we're, we're planning to do. Um, let me adjust this a little bit, if I could. Uh, so I, again, I want to welcome everyone here. Um, it's wonderful to have you all here at this uh, very exciting event, for we are, as President Alger indicated, able to do double duty uh, this afternoon. It's always nice, I know, from the standpoint of university administrators, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so we have a truly remarkable human being uh, here to get together with us who is going to help us accomplish not just one but two keynote feats. Uh, to quote Shakespeare in one fell swoop. Uh, Judy, that's for you, right, yes. <laughs> yes, please do, yes. Uh, that is because, as uh, President Alger noted, this afternoon's speaker, Dr. Rianne Eisler, doubles as both the keynote presenter for the Madison Vision Series, as well as the opening keynote for the Summit Series, which is hosted by JMU this very week, and is called Cultivating the Globally Sustainable Self. I am confident uh, that Shakespeare, were he among us, and perhaps he is for all we know, uh, he would conclude that Rianne manifests the noblest and most heroic attributes of any of his characters, male or female. Uh, which I suspect would be just fine with Rianne, uh, for she has spent no small portion of her life in the pursuit of an essential rapprochement between that which is female and that which is male, in the hope that we might find a way to apprehend 
and ultimately transcend the domination by one half of our species, I'm speaking about my half, uh, toward the other half, and that would be all of you out there without a beard, okay, <laughs> presumably, yeah, uh, which has profoundly negative implications for our daughters, sisters, and wives, as well as the communities and societies in which we reside, our living earth, and most ironic of all, boys and men, as she has convincingly demonstrated, both empirically and in real world terms. Because I admired Rianne's brilliance, passion, and faith, I asked her to work with me and another colleague of hers on an article for a journal under the auspices of the International Beliefs and Values Institute, or IBAVI. She didn't know me from Adam, although I suspect she probably gets Adam as well as anybody, uh, but in her gracious and generative way, uh, she agreed, which begat a lovely process of collaboration together on a piece that remains one of my very favorites and which I still assign to my own doctoral students right here at JMU, right back there, uh, several of whom are with us this afternoon. So when it came time to imagine a keynote for a conference on cultivating the globally sustainable self, Rianne reflexively leapt to the top of the list. We are grateful not only that she accepted our invitation, but embraced the synergy within our approach between the Summit Series and Madison Vision Series the latter of which seeks to illuminate what it means to, to be engaged wholly as a thoughtful citizen and enlightened agent of local and global change. These are aspirational values that James Madison himself exemplified in core aspects of his life and work. I've invoked Shakespeare and Madison deliberately in my comments, since I believe, like the late and great anthropologist Ashley Montague, that Rianne's work is among the most important since Charles Darwin. That is why we have her, her here among us this evening. So at this point, let me ask my dear friend, Dr. Teresa Harris, and my comrade in arms on the forthcoming Summit Series, who had the pleasure of working directly with Rianne as a student in one of her courses, to offer a personal perspective of Rianne as a teacher, leader, and human being in the best and truest sense. Teresa. Thanks to the wonderful lighting in this facility, I'm sure I look much younger than I really am. So just to dispel some things, I am a professor of education. I am 60 years old, and I've been here for a lot of those years. And I took my very first online course last semester with Rian Eisler. It was a cultural transformation course that was, in fact, transformative. My initial correspondence to register for this course, and many of my students can probably relate to this, involved how do you register for something that's online, how do you take care of all the technical issues that you'll face with your particular devices that you've got to work with as they attempt to coordinate with hers wherever they are, and then access all those course materials and all those readings by following the five-page handout we were supposed to go through prior to the start of class. Needless to say, I was a little anxious, not only that my computer would work and I'd ever connect, but then when I saw who else was going to be in the class, they were other people of great renown, people who had wonderful Vitas, and here I was, the kindergarten teacher. So, being a little anxious, I had a marvelous strategy in place that I was going to use. I'm going to do everything I'm told. I'm going to take copious notes. And I'm going to keep my microphone on mute so no one will know how dumb I am compared to everybody else. Well, as we began, I was ready for our experience. And from the first moment that I heard Rian's voice, on the other end of the technology, I started to relax a little bit. This international scholar, this women's rights activist, this author that I so admired and looked up to was a real person. As we were going through introductions, she actually introduced her granddaughter who was participating with us at the time. She welcomed each one of us by name and made a personal connection to each one of us as individuals in this class. 
She sought our opinions and she offered her insights. Dialogue moved back and forth through microphones and those sidebars on the side as we frantically typed to one another, what a great idea. Here's another article. Oh, this is what she's referring to. So it was an incredibly dynamic environment in which we found ourselves. There was even one session where the technology was failing abysmally. And the poor person who was responsible for it was doing everything she could while Rianne continued the conversation with the rest of us, even though we didn't have all the visuals and the materials that we needed at the time. Her significance of caring is real. It runs through the materials that she writes and through the interactions that she has, whether it's in real time or distance time. As you know, through her Center for Partnership Studies and her recently published Social Wealth Economic Indicators, Caring is at the core of her work and at her model, and she is a wonderful exemplar. It takes more than passion or scholarship or even vision to transform the world in which we live. Our commitments to beliefs and values that will sustain ourselves and others depends on actions that are driven from the very heart of who we are as individuals working with one another in partnership. I am pleased to introduce someone who does this so well. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rian Eisler. Well, I have to get my mic on. Can you hear me? And is the other mic on? Um, wait a minute, Craig, is my other mic on? Excuse us, but uh, I, I don't have eyes in the back of my head, so I can't tell. Well, I thank you all, John and Craig and Teresa, for this marvelous introduction. I think, really, I should just sit down and rest on my laurels, don't you think? <laughs> but since you've all come uh, to hear me, and since I've come a very long way, all the way from the West Coast, I think I'll talk with you instead. Um, I really want to say it is for me an honor and a pleasure to be with you here today. Uh, I, I just love the feeling here at James Madison University. I'm very, very grateful for the warmness and the real caring, you know, we, we're using that C word all the time here, uh, that people have displayed toward me. And I'm very excited about being here to do this double function, right, mm -hmm. of uh, being part of uh, President Alger's uh, series as well as the summit. Now, as you know, the title of my presentation is Reexamining Human Nature and recreating society. And as my subtitle uh, signals, which is Four Cornerstones for Transformation, part of my talk will focus on some interventions, on some cornerstones that we can build, um, cornerstones that we really need if we are to have that better future that so many of us here uh, and that the whole summit is dedicated to. And I, I want to say that I have a, an enormous commitment and passion for this work, not only through my research and my writing and my speaking and, yes, my organizing and activism, but as a mother and a grandmother, deeply concerned, as so many of us are, about what kind of future our children will inherit. And of course, what we're here talking about, isn't it, is about becoming engaged so that we can pay a part in shaping that future. Now, I'm going to start with a fundamental question that has animated my work. Uh, the question of what kind of society, what kind of social systems support optimal human development. This is what we're talking about when we're talking about this globally sustainable self, right? 
Uh, and even more specifically, uh, my research has really focused on the question of what kinds of social systems uh, support the expression of our human capacities for consciousness, for caring, for creativity, or alternately, because we also have those capacities, for insensitivity, uh, cruelty, and destructiveness. And this is really a very, very critical question. Because we know from neuroscience today, how many of you are acquainted with some of the new findings from neuroscience? Oh, just a handful of you. Well, uh, <laughs> all right. Well, what we are learning from neuroscience is something that, in a way, the social sciences have been talking about for a long time, but not in these terms and without the empirical evidence. And this is very simply that our brains, the structure of the human brain, actually develops in interaction with its environment. Now, for a species like ours that has such a flexible and adaptive brain, uh, this is really critical, isn't it? And of course, uh, we are at a point in human history where what counts uh, is not whether we live in a savanna or in a forest, right? <laughs> but what counts as the most important environment for us uh, is that human creation we call culture, right? As mediated through all of our social institutions, not only our political and economic and educational institutions, but most foundationally, because, well, our most intense brain development, as you probably have heard, uh, happens during the first years of life. So what we're talking about is our family and other intimate relations, which in turn, of course, uh, are profoundly influenced by what kind of a society we live in and what kind of relations that society supports. So I want to start with something. What we're talking about is not a matter of simple linear causes and effects. What we're talking about is what more and more scientists are beginning to focus on, interactive, mutually supporting and reinforcing processes. Now, to better understand these processes, as we must, if we are, through our engagement, help to more effectively address uh, today's unprecedented and really mounting our global environmental, economic, and social challenges, well, we need what Einstein said we need, new ways of thinking. Or as he put it, uh, we cannot solve problems with the same thinking that created them. Nonetheless, when most of us think of social systems, what immediately comes to mind are old categories right versus left, religious versus secular, eastern versus western, uh, northern versus southern, uh, capitalist versus socialist or communist, etc. And <laughs> I am going to suggest to you that uh, using these categories is not productive. Something that actually becomes obvious if you consider that societies in every one of these categories have been repressive, violent, environmentally destructive, uh, violators of human rights, etc. So I am inviting you to join me today, and hopefully after today too, uh, in going outside these old categories and looking at human societies from a perspective that transcends them, uh, a perspective that I've really offers a new analytical lens for us, for understand society. And this is the lens of two underlying social configurations, identified by my research and increasingly uh, by the research of others. And I encourage you really 
to be part of that, to really study this. One of this com configuration is what I call the domination or dominator system, and the other one, the partnership system. And of course, I will, during my talk, um, exp you know, describe to you what I mean by these configurations, what they are. Uh, I'm going to propose to you that the tension between these two uh, configurations underlies all of our cultural evolution. And I'm also going to propose to you that once we look at our past, present, and the possibilities for our future, are uh, using these new social categories, or rather, the lens of the partnership domination continuum, because it's always a matter of degree. No society you know, orients completely to either end. That what happens, uh, and I'll try to illustrate a little of that, is that paths to a more equitable, sustainable, and caring future become visible. So we've got a lot to cover. But I was asked to tell you a little bit about myself first. So I'm going to do that um, because it's relevant, actually. You know, my passion for this work is really deeply rooted in my own early childhood experiences. Uh, as Craig said, I was born in Europe at a time, actually, when in terms of this conceptual framework of the partnership domination continuum, was a time of massive regression to the domination side. It was the rise to power of the Nazis in Germany and my native Austria. And from one day to the next, uh, my whole world as a kid, you know, this cute little kid that people patted on the head, was well, suddenly my parents and I, we became hunted with license to kill. And we escaped by a miracle. Uh, by a miracle, we were able to get a visa to Cuba, one of the last ships that was admitted uh, where you could purchase visas because then they stopped doing that. And there, because of course the Nazis confiscated, you know that's an official term for armed robbery, everything that my parents owned, I grew up uh, in poverty <laughs> uh, in those first years in the industrial slums of Havana. And it was also there that I learned that most of my extended family, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, were murdered in the Holocaust, as would have happened to my parents and to me had we not, by a miracle, been able to get out. Now, obviously, these traumatic experiences had a profound impact on me. And they led to questions that I am sure every one of you has at some point in your lives asked. Does it have to be this way? When we humans have such an enormous capacity for caring, right? I mean, we, we see it all around us. And for creativity and for sensitivity, why has there been so much insensitivity, cruelty, violence? Is it inevitable, you know, as we're so often told, you know, original sin, selfish genes, what have you? Or are there alternatives? And if so, what are they? And it was indeed these questions that eventually uh, if you will, were the impetus for my research. But of course, not until some time went by and until quite a few other life experiences. And I just want to touch briefly on one that was pivotal for me. And that was in the late 1960s, when along with thousands of other women, I suddenly woke up as if from a long drugged sleep to realize that a lot of problems that I thought were me, you know, Something is wrong with me. I don't fit. But then I discovered, because we were doing these consciousness raising groups, right, that, gee, I shared them with all these women. And you know, the light bulb was, oh my gosh, these are social problems, right? So naturally, I threw myself, um, because I tend to you know, be rather passionate about things, into the women's movement. And uh, <laughs> well, because my background is in both social science as well as system science. I was way back, uh, I, my first job was for an offshoot of the RAND Corporation uh, called the Systems Development Corporation. And you know, I mean, nobody was talking about system science then, but I also have a background, as does President Alger, in law. So naturally, uh, we were trying to change 
laws at that time. And indeed, uh, we have something in common. We both uh, have written important uh, friend of the court briefs to the US Supreme Court. The one that I wrote at that time uh, argued the then radical notion that women should be considered persons under the purview of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Uh, that was, you know, very, very strange idea at the time. Um, <laughs> I, as, as I think uh, Craig said, I taught the first courses at UCLA on the social and legal status of women. I wrote the first um, and only really mass paperback on the proposed Equal Rights Amendment. So um, really, uh, I was part of something we're celebrating this month, Women's History Month, right? Yes, and in my small way, I was part of that history, which I wish were not relegated to the sidebar of women's history, because kids get it, you know? Like Black History Month or whatever, it's not important. It's, a, it's not part of the main event, right? So we've got to change that. But anyway, so uh, yes, we did make some strides. But in the end, especially after the Equal Rights Amendment was defeated, uh, it became very clear. And by the way, I predicted in the Equal Rights Handbook that that would herald not only a backlash against women, but a massive political regression. And it did, and we're still in it and trying to get out of it, which we have to and we will. But, uh, well, what became evident is that as important as it is to change laws, we really are talking about the need for a cultural transformation. Then the question was, well, a transformation from what to what, right? And that eventually led back to the questions of my childhood and uh, to what are now uh, almost four decades of interdisciplinary, cross-cultural, historical uh, research. Now, in the course of that research, and I do want to tell you about this because I think it's important, I developed a new method of analysis, the study of relational dynamics. And what this focuses on uh, are two key sets of dynamics. One is, well, what kind of relations does a particular culture support? And secondly, because remember systems was my background, uh, how do the key elements of a social system relate to one another to maintain the essential character of the system. Now, to use this method, uh, I ended up by, well, by drawing from a much larger database than most studies of society. You know, most, quote, important studies of society, of course, focus on politics, economics, the so-called public sphere. But they leave out where we all live, don't they? <laughs> the cultural construction of our family and other intimate relations. And I'll get back to that because it is really foundational. Yes, uh, having gone through the 60s, of course, I drew from a database that includes the whole of humanity, both its male and female halves. And as I will just give you a glimpse of, uh, it also uh, included uh, the whole span of our history, including that long period, thousands of years, before recorded history that we call prehistory. Now, uh, we all know, right, that if you only look at part of a picture, obviously you don't see the whole picture. And you certainly cannot see the configuration of the picture, right? And so using this approach, what kept happening is that uh, it was possible to see configurations, connections, patterns that are not visible using the conventional approaches. And that's when you know, there were no names for them. 
So I called one configuration the dominator or domination system and the other one the partnership system. Now there are other differences in this approach such as that, as I said, rather than looking at simple causes and effects, the study of relational dynamics takes into account some of the new theories, uh, system self-organizing theory. I don't know how many have, have had contact with that, as well as chaos theory, showing empirically that in periods of great disequilibrium, living systems, and of course that's what a society is, are able, are capable, of transformational change. I mean, change is a constant, but the issue is transformational change. Uh, so if we now look at modern history, I'm going to start with that with you. Uh, from this perspective, it is possible to see that during the time of intense disequilibrium brought by the shift from a primarily agrarian to an industrial technology and society, uh, there has been strong movement towards the partnership side of the continuum, albeit countered every inch of the way by fierce resistance and, yes, by periodic regressions. Uh, what you see then is that all the modern progressive movements have a common thread. They have all challenged in one way or another entrenched traditions of domination. Uh, think about it, the so-called rights of man movement. What did they challenge? The so-called divinely ordained right of kings to rule over their, quote, subjects. The feminist movement challenging another so-called divinely ordained tradition, right? The supposed right of men to rule over the women and children in the, quote, castles of their homes, you know, a military. Uh, image. The anti-slavery and later the civil rights and anti-colonial movements, another so-called divinely ordained tradition was challenged, wasn't it? Uh, the right, quote unquote, of a, quote, superior race to rule over so-called inferior ones. If you look at the movement for social equity and for economic equity, what was it challenging? top-down control of resources, dictatorial rule. Uh, if you look at the movements against the use of violence to impose one's will on others, whether it's the peace movement or the more recent and extremely significant uh, movement to really stop entrenched traditions of violence against women and children in families. Again, traditions of domination, all the way to the environmental movement, challenging another hallowed tradition, you know, the <laughs> man's or human's conquest of nature, right? Which at our level of technological development could very well do us in. So uh, what we are here dealing with, of course, is this common thread. But nonetheless, and this is something that we have to understand, traditions of domination are still deeply, deeply embedded in most world cultures. And they are our heritage well, from times that oriented more to, more, more to the, you know, the domination side. I mean, if you look at the European Middle Ages, and I sometimes say it as a joke when I get depressed, I think of the European Middle Ages because we've moved away from them, showing that change is possible. But think about it. Uh, they really looked a lot like the Taliban, didn't they? I mean, the Inquisition, you couldn't even think of something outside of the you know, dogma from those above. Uh, the Inquis Inquisition was not by itself. It was accompanied also by things like the Crusades. Well, holy wars, right? Jihads. The witch burnings, terrorizing women. Uh, so yes, this was a time uh, when, well, extreme poverty, hunger, chronic violence uh, was the norm, really. There were some partnership elements, and there were some periods of, of partnership resurgence. But, but basically, it really was, with its chronic human rights violations, what people used to call it an earthly veil of tears, right? That you only escaped 
you know, after death, but not on this earth, because that's just how it was. Well, what we see here actually is not so very different. It's a rigid domination system. If you look at the most repressive and regressive modern regimes, uh, be it Western, like uh, Hitler's Germany, or uh, Stalin's Soviet Union, you know, be it uh, Eastern, like Khomeini's Iran, or yeah, the so-called uh, Islamic Caliphate of ISIS or ISIL. Um, you can look at a tribal society like Idi Amin's Uganda. I mean, what you really see is in sharp relief the core, and I want to tell you about the core configuration of the domination system. Because despite all of their differences, they share that core configuration. In the first place, authoritarian rule in both the family and the state or tribe. And that's very important because we haven't looked at the family generally, have we? Secondly, the rigid ranking of, well, one half of humanity over the other half. And with this, a very distorted socialization system uh, in which anything that in domination systems is uh, supposed to be real masculinity, you know, domination, conquest, violence, is given higher value than anything that is stereotypically associated with women or the feminine, such as empathy, caring, nonviolence. Uh, and the third part of the configuration, of course, is what you would expect, a high degree of built-in institutionalized and even idealized abuse and violence because it's needed to maintain these rigid rankings of domination, be it man over man, man over woman, race over race, religion over religion, you know, all the way through. Uh, now, if you look at the partnership system, uh, it has a very different configuration. Uh, what you see, first of all, is a more democratic and egalitarian structure in both the family and the state or tribe. The second thing is, yes, you see uh, a more equal partnership between the two halves of humanity, female and male. And third, there is some violence. I mean, people lose it. You know, there has to be you know, some violence, but it doesn't have to be built into the system because it's not needed to maintain its structure. So again, cultures with this configuration can be very different. Uh, it can be a tribal society like the Tedurai, studied by the University of California anthropologist Stuart Schlegel. It can be an agrarian society like the Minangkabau of Sumatra, studied by the University of Pennsylvania, um, anthropologist Peggy Reeves Sandai. Uh, and yes, it can also be a, a more contemporary society um, that's industrial or post-industrial. And we see that movement towards the partnership side uh, in modern history, actually most clearly in nations such as Sweden, Norway, Finland, which are not ideal societies. OK, let's get away from this notion. You know, it's very funny. People accept all kinds of horrible things in domination systems. But if you have an alternative, if it's not perfect, no good, right? Well, we've got to get rid of that thinking. But if you really look at them, they have a generally higher standard of living. Without these huge gaps between haves and have-nots, characteristic of domination systems. They have more democracy in both the family and in the state. Uh, as for violence, they have been in the forefront of trying to leave behind traditions of, of violence. I mean, think about it. The first peace studies came out of these Nordic nations. Uh, the first laws are saying it's against the law to use physical discipline against children in families came out of these nations. A very strong men's movement to disentangle, quote, masculinity from its association with domination and violence. Now, these are not coincident coincidental. These are configurations. And they are configurations 
in which the third element, which is this more equal partnership between the female and male half of humanity, uh, plays a very important part. I mean, we're talking about mutually supportive, remember, interactive elements, not simple causes and effects. Because what you see is, for example, in the World, uh, of, um, uh, World Economic Forum's annual reports, these nations have the lowest gender gaps. Unfortunately, there is no nation yet that has no gender gap. But at the same time, and I will get back to that when we talk about economics, they also um, has, have very high ratings in the World Economic Forum's Global Competitiveness Reports. So yeah, partnership systems really are effective. But I do want to, before I go on, clarify some very important points. Because when people hear partnership, and I sometimes rule the day that I use that term, because you know, I, it was when, before partnership became the synonym for um, you know, joint ventures, right? I was, and I thought, well, in a business partnership, there is mutual respect, mutual, I mean, at least in theory, mutual benefit, <laughs> mutual accountability. Anyway, but so people think very often that, well, the difference between a domination and a partnership system is that it, there's only cooperation in partnership systems. In reality, I mean, think about it, people cooperate all the time in domination systems. Monopolies, ooh, they cooperate. Invading armies, terrorists, uh, criminal cartels, that's not the difference. And another thing that we really have to understand, I mean, this is based on empirical research rather than on you know, simplistic thinking, uh, rather than being a completely flat organization, uh, which is not realistic. I mean, what? We, every society needs parents, needs teachers, needs managers, needs leaders, right? So I coined another set of new terms, uh, the difference between what I've called hierarchies of domination and hierarchies of actualization. Well, we all know what a hierarchy of domination is, right? You know, you better obey orders from above or else. Lots of pain, right, of some kind or another. Uh, and yes, in, in, in that system, uh, accountability, respect, benefit only flows from the bottom up, right? In a hierarchy of actualization, they flow both ways. And another difference is that power is really conceptualized differently. It is conceptualized more as power to, which certainly is very important, and power with rather than simply power over. Now, as, there, as I said, there has been movement to the partnership side. It's interesting that you read about this, don't you, in the management literature, that you know, the effective manager is no longer the copper controller, right? But somebody who inspires, who facilitates, who empowers rather than disempowers. So as we move to the partnership side, we still have hierarchies. And I really want to make that point. Uh, now, there are many other differences, of course, between the two systems. Uh, but as, and I've detailed those, by the way, in my book, starting with, uh, as was mentioned, The Chalice and the Blade, which I'm happy to tell you is now in 26 foreign editions. It was just acquired some 30 years after publication by a Turkish house. It's coming out in Turkish, which is really exciting for me. Um, and that book is a retelling of our cultural evolution, which actually shows that much that we today is, you know, consider as brand new and even radical, you know, like the women's movement, right, or the movement towards more harmony with nature, that really it isn't all that new and radical, that it actually has ancient roots. And I'll just give you very, very distilled. For example, you know, you've all heard the story about how we have inherited these evolutionary imperatives, right, from our gathering, hunting, or as they call them, hunting, gathering, when actually most of the food came from gathering, but that's, you're beginning to see how history is told. Um, well, you know, that, that, that we've wired, right? for violence, for domination. Well, you know, there's more and more research verifying uh, you know, some of the findings in the chalice and the blade. Most recently, 
studies of contemporary gathering hunting societies, um, including a recent volume in Oxford University Press volume, which is very important, you know, sort of making a little inroad, right, into the canon here, just a small inroad, showing that actually most of contemporary, and not all of them, but most contemporary gathering hunting societies really are more egalitarian and are less violent. Surprise, right? And if you really uh, look, uh, as I have and as others are beginning to do, and it's really exciting, it's, it's, a, it's a tremendous uh, a, a adventure, you know, to re-examine uh, our cultural evolution. Because if you really start looking at our earliest agrarian farming cultures, uh, you begin to see that despite everything we're told, uh, actually there was still much of an orientation there to the partnership side. Again, not ideal, okay? But there's a the biggest Neolithic, you know, early farming site ever excavated is a site in Anatolia in Turkey called Çatalhöyük. And uh, what you find there, uh, well, the first anthropologist who excavated was a British archaeologist, James Maillard, and he found no signs of destruction for a thousand years through warfare. Okay, I mean, that's interesting. It's not what we think of, is it? Not only that, in both the structure of the houses and the grave goods, no signs of huge or even significant differences in them, in status, in wealth. And as the man, the archaeologist, who is now excavating Chatalhuyak, uh, Ian Harder, um, wrote, and I have to add with some amazement, in a Scientific American article that he wrote called Women and Men in Chatalhuyak, uh, he found that this is a society in which sexual differences did not translate into differences in status or power. Indeed, quote, a society in which sex is relatively unimportant in assigning social roles, end of quote. Now, you know, you hear this kind of information and a lot of cognitive dissonance isn't there because that is not the story you've been taught. It is simply not. I mean, the story you've been taught is, yeah, there never was and never can be anything except the domination system, right? So. But I want to point out something very quickly and in passing, that actually if we really look at some of our earliest myths and legends, we have clues to this earlier time. Of course, they got idealized. For example, in the Tao Te Ching, you know, one of the oldest Chinese uh, existing literature, what do you find? You find that there was a time before the yin or feminine principle was subordinated to the yang or male principle in a time in which we're explicitly told was not only more peaceful and prosperous, but a time when the wisdom of the mother, not just of the father, you know, all of these males with beards that we keep reading about, the wisdom of the mother, <laughs> well, it's kind of funny in a way, uh, was still, uh, well, still honored. And on the West, I'll give you just one example, Hesiod, who was really, in many ways, awful with his Pandora's box and you know, all of that. But even he, he writes that there was once a, quote, golden race uh, who tilled their fields in peaceful ease before there came in a lesser race who brought with them Ares, the Greek god of war. You can't be more explicit, can you? Well, I won't go into too much of that. Except to say that, of course, uh, obviously, uh, we wouldn't be here talking about this if there hadn't been, as documented in The Chalice and the Blade for, and other books now, you know, by other authors, and for the, for the West, as well as also for the East. Uh, uh, there's a book called The Chalice and the Blade in Chinese Culture, uh, written by scholars at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences finding that, yes, that there was, during a time of disequilibrium, a massive shift to the domination side, and really a very brutal shift. And of course, since then, 
uh, there was still periodic movement, because I'm trying to give you sort of a whole different gestalt here. There was still periodic movement if you use the partnership domination continuum as a lens to the partnership side of a early Christianity, right? I mean, if you know anything about it, it was very, very, these early communities were very partnership oriented. Then came the regression, didn't it? The use of religion to say, well, you know, domination, control, violence to impose this are divinely ordained. And as I noted, during the last several centuries, during the disequilibrium of the shift from a primarily agrarian to an industrial society, especially in the West, more and more people have come together to challenge one tradition of domination after another. However, and this is really critical, most of the progressive social movements have focused on dismantling the top of the domination pyramid, right? Politics, economics, religion, religious control, etc. But far, far less attention has been paid to changing the foundations on which that pyramid keeps rebuilding itself. Whether it was in the 20th century, you know, with, with uh, the, the totalitarianism of Hitler and Stalin, whether it is today with the so-called uh, religious fundamentalism, because I think you've got it by now, this is really not religious. It is dominator fundamentalism, right? I mean, it is not coincidental that it was a top priority for the Nazis, getting women back into their, quote, traditional place in a, quote, traditional family, code words, aren't they? For a rigidly male-dominated, highly punitive family where children learn very early on that it's very painful to even question orders from above, because there's going to be a lot of pain if you do. Uh, Khomeini, same thing. So whether it's Eastern or Western or Northern or Southern, this is really a regression to the domination system, uh, really picking scriptural elements uh, that justify that, which, which at the core of most world religions are teachings of partnership, aren't they? you know, caring, empathy, nonviolence, if you will, quote, feminine values, but they're not, they're human values. And then there came this encrustment, right, to use religion. Well, you know how it has been used. I don't have to tell you that. So what we're really talking about, again, is a configuration. It's not coincidental that these people also want to see top-down rule, not only in the family, right, but in the state or tribe, or that they're into this holy war. War is holy, you know, whether it's jihad or violence, you know, or Hitler. I mean, it doesn't matter. But the ironic thing, and again, this is really something that I hope that you pay attention to. While the people who are trying to push us back, you know, to more rigid domination systems, get it, okay? Ironically, many people who consider themselves progressives still view violations of the human rights of women and children as just women's issues and just children's issues. Never mind, we're the majority, right? But hey, we've been socialized a certain way, haven't we? And I have to tell you that I've written uh, very extensively in the human rights area. I wrote the first article for the Human Rights Quarterly back in 1987. Uh, on what has since then become known as women's rights as human rights. And my most recent uh, contribution is an article for a Cambridge University Press book, a chapter that I called Protecting the Majority of Humanity, uh, advocating something that I hope will someday happen, using international law like the Rome Statute to really include crimes against, you know, based on gender, based on childhood, under the purview of international law, of the Rome Statute, because it simply hasn't been enough. You know, the, we, we've come, I mean, there has been progress. We're finally talking about this, right? But it hasn't been enough. But anyway, to go on, because uh, we have a ways to go here, and I want to be able to talk with you, and I haven't even gotten to my cornerstones. So I'm going to jump with you. I mean, look, what I'm trying to say to you is 
that we have to really pay much more attention to these primary human relations, which, as I said, neuroscience show are so profoundly influential even to the neural structure of our brain. And this does take me finally to the rest of my talk, to the four cornerstones. Um, and you know, it's interesting because you certainly wouldn't build a house, would you, without having some kind of a floor plan, including the foundations, right? So I am going to uh, suggest to you, they're not the only ones, but they are critical, four cornerstones. And the first one, and that's not going to be a surprise to you, is childhood relations, right? Why? We know from neuroscience, as I said, that what children experience or observe in their family and other early relations impacts nothing less than how our brains develop. Now, genes matter, OK? But it's very interesting. There are now studies showing that even genetic predispositions are not necessarily expressed unless they are activated by experience and especially childhood experiences. So what we're talking about here is not genes, but gene expression. And there is a big, big difference. And we're certainly not talking about genetic or evolutionary determinism, which is another wonderful rationale, you know? That's how it is. Can't be done anything about. OK. So, OK. So look, I mean, I, I want to just have you think for a moment. I mean, what happens when, when, uh, when we really know how our brains develop? A lot of interesting things are coming to light. And one of the most fascinating findings from neuroscience, and I'm writing about some of this in the new book I've been working on for about a decade now, <laughs> is that <laughs> it takes me a while. <laughs> that really our impulses, our human impulses, towards empathy, towards helpfulness, towards mutuality, they seem to be wired into our brains. Because, for example, studies using brain scans show that what are popularly, call, popularly called the brain's pleasure centers light up more when we are are in a relation of mutuality, of helpfulness, than when we only look out for ourselves. Now, that's really interesting, isn't it? I mean, it certainly is not the story you've been told. OK. But the problem is that these kinds of experiments are all, you know, one here, one there. And what, what you need is really to bring them together. And that's what, I'm, what this framework makes it possible for us to do. Now, this is, however, a very crucial point. Sure, we, we have this impulse. But think about it. If people grow up in rigid domination cultures or subcultures, they tend to develop a brain adaptive, don't they, to their environments. And actually, in these kinds of settings where relationships are based on strict rankings of domination and submission, this adaptation can be a survival requisite. You know, think about it. I mean, people don't usually, in a very rigid domination system, live long, do they, if they fail to obey orders. You know, they're burned at the stake, uh, they're stoned to death, they're in, put in prison. You know, as, I mean, as used to be the norm, really, in much of the West, and is still the norm, unfortunately, in far too many places today, which is why we have to change on a work on a global cultural transformation, OK? But, uh, you know, you're such a wonderful audience, I want to tell you everything, and I can't. So, all right. So, think about it. So, in these kinds of cultures, harsh, stress stressful, highly punitive, uh, painful, right? Parenting can actually be required, can't it, to teach people that their parents' will is law, uh, so that they, in turn, will be able to function in a rigid domination system. So, you know, start putting the pieces together, and you again and again see the enormous importance of early childhood relations. I mean, what do children learn in families where relations are based on fear and force? One of the lessons they learn is that it is even moral to use violence to impose your will on others. And you can certainly generalize that, can't you? And that takes me to the second cornerstone. And no surprise, gender relations. I mean, there are two halves of humanity. 
two fundamental halves of humanity, female and male. And what we really have to understand is that, well, think about it, another lesson that children learn in rigid domination families, they learn to equate difference. Beginning with the fundamental difference between female and male, with either superiority or inferiority, with either dominating or being dominated, with either being served or serving. And then they can generalize that, you know, which they learn very early on, perhaps even on a neural, but certainly on an emotional and cognitive level. They can generalize that to every difference, racial, uh, religious, sexual orientation, I mean, you name it. And so what do you expect, really, when you have that kind of a foundation? Uh, now, what we have to really understand is that if we look at, there are signs of hope, of course. I mean, the global women's movement, the fact that so many men today uh, are doing fathering, right? You know, they're diapering babies, uh, they're feeding babies, you know, the way that no real man would ever do in a rigid domination system, right? Uh, and, you know, women are beginning slowly to enter positions of economic and political leadership, but it's much too slow. So what we have to do is we have to really focus on changing this tradition of devaluing not only the female half of humanity, but everything associated with the female half of humanity, stereotypically now, you know, because as you can see, it's nothing inherent in women or men here. So, because this is so interesting, actually, and I have learned after years and years of just using, you know, the human rights, social justice arguments, that we actually have to also use an economic benefits argument, which takes me to my third cornerstone, economics. Because, you know, the devaluation of the so-called feminine inherent in domination systems actually adversely affects a nation's general quality of life. And I'm going to give you quickly some empirical evidence because you always want to quantify it, don't you? So we, in 1995, at the Center for Partnership Studies, did a pioneering study uh, in which we compared two bundles, uh, one bundle uh, from 89 nations now, statistical data from 89 nations, one bundle uh, measures of quality of life, you know, infant mortality, access to portable water, human rights and environmental ratings. The other bundle were measures, there was some overlap, measures of the status of women. And we found that actually in significant respects, the status of women can be a better predictor of general quality of life than GDP. And other studies have since then verified this. The World Values Survey and the annual gender gap reports. Remember I told you nations with the lowest uh, gender gaps rank very high in the World Economic Forum's Global Competitiveness Reports. Now, obviously, one reason is, well, women are half of the population, right? But that's not the whole thing. And what I really would like to sort of entice you to do is to think in terms of systems dynamics, OK, of these connections. Because what you really begin to see is precisely that uh, when women are devalued, so are values like caring for people, yeah, starting in early childhood, which have a terrible effect on quality of life, and in our post-industrial, not a service age, have a terrible effect on our future economic competitiveness, but I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, they remain subordinate, excluded, right? So it is really, uh, you know, let me, just, let me just backtrack, because we're so used, again, to thinking of economics in terms of capitalism versus socialism, right? Well, I'm going to propose to you that neither is capable of helping us get through this. For one thing, both theories came out of industrial times, right? Early industrial times. And we are well into the post-industrial knowledge service age. But even beyond that, both came out of times that still oriented much more to the domination side. So for both Smith and Marx, nature, I mean, just read the theories. Nature is there to be exploited. 
As for the work of caring for people, right? That so-called women's work in families, for them, that was just reproductive work and not the important productive work. You know, and we are saddled with this in the economic canon. I've written about this because we really have to re-examine the framework, don't we? And change it. So what we are really uh, seeing is that really we have to get beyond that old thinking, if only. Because, as I said, neuroscience shows that the work of caring for people, starting in early childhood, as well as high quality early childhood education, you know, these women's kind of things, that they are essential to produce that high quality human capital that economists never tire of telling us, right, is the capital needed for the post-industrial knowledge service age. Uh, you know, so we have to really change our thinking about what is or is not valuable. And to, <laughs> to do this, really, we have to get out of the trap of capitalism versus socialism. And look, look at the uh, mass application of socialism in the former Soviet Union and in China. A disaster, environmentally, uh, humanly. Why? Because the underlying culture is still oriented so much to the domination side. And if you look at the latest iteration of capitalism, so-called neoliberalism, and you know, they're so amazing how they could use liberalism in there. Because, you know, supply uh, side economics and so-called trickle-down economics, which is what this is about, what is it? It's a trying to push us back to the time when people were still brainwashed, really, to content themselves with the scraps <coughs> dropping from the opulent tables of those on top, isn't it? I mean, it, 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 it's... So the issue, my friends, is not capitalism or socialism. It is domination economics, be it tribal, be it feudal, be it mercantilist, uh, be it Eastern, <laughs> be it Western, uh, be it, you know, it, it's just, if we're trapped in that, we're not going to get anywhere. So, all right, so what we need, and I'll very quickly go through this, is really a new perspective on economics. And I've written very extensively about that in my book, The Real Wealth of Nations. And yes, I did borrow from Adam Smith. Um, uh, you know, what it points out is, again, something that once you think about it sounds obvious, that the real wealth of a nation of our world isn't financial. I mean, look at the stock market, up, down, sideways, you know, that it consists of the contributions of people and of nature, and that we need what we have not had, which is economic measurements, policies, and practices that give real visibility and adequate value to the work of caring for people starting in early childhood and caring for our Mother Earth. And the first step, and I, I, I don't know that I have time to go into that with you, but it's really changing our economic measures. I, I will for a moment because it is really important. You know, GDP, you know, is the measure. And of course, it's a very peculiar measure because think about it. Uh, GDP actually includes under productivity activities that harm and take life. Making and selling cigarettes, the medical bills, the funeral bills, they're fantastic for GDP. Oil spills, wonderful for GDP. The cleanup costs, the, you know, the endless lawsuits, terrific, they all, but not only does GDP put negatives in as positives, it fails to include the non-market sectors, the contributions of the natural economy, the volunteer economy, and yes, the household economy. For goodness sakes, I mean, <laughs> we really would not have a workforce at all, much less that high quality human capital, if it weren't for that, quote, women's work, right? So uh, to make a long story short, uh, we at the Center for Partnership Studies, as you will see, have a caring economy campaign. 
And one of the things, uh, really I think one of our most important contributions to date is we have just launched a new set of metrics, social wealth economic indicators that actually show the economic, now just, just, just economic, okay? Never mind the human value or the environmental value, the economic value of the work of caring for people and nature. And this I hope you will use uh, because uh, what, what, what we did is we compared uh, the United States with other developed nations. And I'll tell you something, if we don't catch up, we, have the, we invest the least in early childhood education. We invest less than half of what other developed nations do in family support. Uh, Yes, we have the highest child poverty rate. What else do you expect when you have policies like that? And it is not only inhuman, but it is totally dysfunctional in terms of what these people keep talking about, right? Which is economic effectiveness. And that's our argument. So I'm going to fast forward with you. Uh, there are studies, by the way, that are in the Real Wealth of Nations and also on our website, caringeconomy.org, uh, showing that caring policies are actually good for business. Uh, companies that are always in the Fortune 500 best companies to work for have higher return to investors. And I've already mentioned to you the Nordic nations, right, which have more of a partnership configuration. And here is something interesting. These nations, women uh, are, have, it's not only the smallest gender gap, but they also are 40 to 50 percent of the national legislature. So you really can talk about representative democracy there, you know, which you can't in other places. But what happens as the status of women rises, men no longer find it such a threat to their status, their quote masculinity, to also embrace more stereotypically soft, feminine, values. And that's what we're seeing, aren't we? You know, in certain parts of the world anyway. But now we've got to get that into social and economic policy. And how do we do it? Well, this really takes me to, well, the, I, there are some flyers on our webinars that you can look at. We also have a coalition and I invite you to have your organizations join it. But I want to quickly end with the fourth cornerstone, which is stories. Uh, we've already seen how we need a new story, don't we? And it's up to you to see that that new story spreads, that that new story has more and more empirical evidence behind it, and that new story becomes part of what is considered the canon, because the canon, well, we won't even go into that. Uh, you know, it, it, we're really talking about systems, aren't we? Systems change. So we have to change our stories and our language. We have to show, yes, that the struggle for our future is not between right and left and religion and secularism and north and south and east and west. It's between this pullback towards the domination system and the movement towards the partnership way of life. And you can all be part of this, and especially here, in, as an academic, uh, really we have an opportunity, don't we, in our research, in our classes, to weave this in and to begin to make that story because the stories that you tell in your classes are what so many people take away, don't they? As, well, truth, right? Reality. So uh, it's a really an unprecedented challenge and especially in this time of intense disequilibrium with the shift from the industrial into the post-industrial knowledge age, we have another opportunity, it's unprecedented, uh, to change the stories and of course to change the institutions <laughs> as well as the stories. So look, cultures are human creations and it's up to us to all of us, in our, we can't do everything, but everybody can do something, to use our enormous capacities for creativity and yes, for consciousness and for caring, to build the foundations for that more peaceful and equitable partnership future. So let's do it for ourselves, 
for our children and generations to come. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I want to talk with you now. I hope I didn't, it didn't take too long, but I wanted to tell you, sort of give you the whole gestalt, if I could. And we did start late, I will say. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, do you have, I'd love to talk with you now. Um, my name is Eric Lafreniere. I'm with uh, JMU's Department of Writing, Rhetoric, and Technical Communication. I had two questions. One of them was a really easy, fun, theoretical question. I'm not going to ask that. I'm going to ask you the hard, practical question. And that is, uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for Chalice and the Blade in particular, but everything afterwards. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Eric, for the work that you're doing, for the survey that you've done applying these principles, you're a shining exemplar of people being able to use this. Can you still hear me? No. Oh, well, somebody took away my mic. Oh, you're, well, I was just saying he's a shining exemplar of using this work in the survey that he's done using these principles. But come back here. Well, well I, I can speak here. It's okay. okay. Um, so my question to you is, how do you frame within the dominator partnership model. How do you frame uh, the, the current, uh, right now in California, but here in Virginia too, there's a controversy over the increased use of adjunct faculty on college campuses. Right, hard, practical question. How do you frame within the dominator partnership model this controversy? How well, do I don't think that it's a mystery to anybody, is it? Um, the fact of the matter is that what you're seeing is pure and simple domination and exploitation, isn't it? I mean, you make somebody, you call somebody adjunct, right? No benefits, low pay, and so you're unionizing. And that's what you have to do. Uh, but that's not the only thing you have to do. We really have to change the thinking about education. My goodness, education starting way early. You know that we pay childcare workers less than dog walkers? I mean, it's ridiculous. I mean, not, I love dogs, but still, I mean, it doesn't make sense. So yes, so I would very much place it in that. And I think the fact that you're joining together, that you're unionizing, and that you are explaining to people why this is wrong, and why the work that you're doing as adjunct uh, is very, very important is part of the shift to the partnership side. So thank you, Eric. Thank you. Hi, I'm Hi. Jennifer. Um, um, what I'd like to ask is what would you say to teenagers these days? Um, I have a son, he's grown up in a partnership household, but he's going out into the world at 15 and he's encountering a dominator society. And it's very hard for him because he doesn't like what he sees and he doesn't know where to go to find partnership. Because what he's finding in the teenage community is kind of a culture of cruelty, okay? And pockets of that. And unfortunately, the school, he homeschooled up until he decided he needed more interaction. But in going to school, he's finding the culture of cruelty. And it's been a real wake up for him this past year. So what would you say to him? And how can he find um, his way toward <coughs> partnership and community? It's very difficult, and especially for boys, I have to say. Because the male peer group, of course, has been a way uh, not, not that girls don't bully, I mean, they do plenty of it. But, uh, and it's part of the domination system, you know, they carry that thinking with them. I, I can only say that you've given him values. And if you explain to him that that is something that we're working to change. And also, 
that he can perhaps find his community. And really, it's very hard to tell a teen not to worry about peer pressure. I mean, that's it, right? But still, uh, for example, some of the alumni from one of our um, uh, caring economy webinars uh, in a high school, a very multicultural uh, high school actually, formed the Caring Economy Club. So there are pockets of kids, or you create such a pocket, but that is, it is very difficult because that tension between these two pulls, you know, you're pulling him to be the kind of man that he needs to be, and the peer group is saying, hey, if you want to belong, you know, so I, all I can tell you is I see it with my grand, grandson, with especially my younger one. And um, it's hard. Yeah, I'm sorry. Don't have a handy tablet form answer here. Yes, is there somebody else? One more. Oh, just one? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been looking forward. Oh, there is somebody way back there. <laughs> Uh, cool. uh, my name is Paul Davis. I'm, I'm a philosopher, William and Mary. Um, and I'm very interested in the, these two configurations that you're describing. Um, but here's the kind of worry that someone like Karl Popper would have. Once you start seeing uh, social structures or historical changes in terms of these two categories, you start seeing it everywhere. And Popper would, would ask you, um, what would count as disconfirming um, your hypothesis that these two categories are describing the evolution of human culture? <coughs> what would count as evidence that, no, no, neither of them is the best description or the right way to describe what has happened at you know, some period of history? Well, look, I think first of all, that, of course, uh, there is going to be resistance to new ways of thinking. And what you're bringing up is the question of, well, how do we verify, right? Uh, that the tension between these two, if you will, attractors in terms of nonlinear dynamics have actually been there throughout human cultural evolution. Uh, I would say this to you. We're so used to thinking in terms of linear movements, okay? And the story we've been told is that there has been this linear progression, right, from savagery to, quote, civilization. Well, I mean, look at what happens in some of the civilizations. It doesn't, it doesn't work. If you think of history as this theoretical framework does, as nonlinear, uh, more in terms of attractors, you know, some of the new principles that we're beginning to, to use, uh, for example, you can then see that modern history, you know, when I talked about uh, the partnership movement countered by regression, well, it's not an upward linear movement. It's more of a spiral upward movement with dips, you know, regressions. But it still is an upward movement. As I said, you know, when I get depressed, I think of the European Middle Ages. And the fact that we have moved from there to here uh, shows me that human agency can make a difference. And I also want to say this, that um, this whole interdisciplinary approach is also new to the academy. I mean, it's beginning to make some inroads. But you couldn't possibly develop this conceptual framework within one discipline. So there are all kinds of reasons for trying to, sh to shoot it down. But I'm going to ask you, if you look at history, and you begin to see these patterns, be it in your daily life, be it in the modern movement towards partnership, uh, be it in the regressions, uh, you can think for yourself. Is there some reality here? And remember, we're not talking about a pure partnership or domination system. We're talking of matters of degree, but what we are talking about is another human possibility for a species that has such an enormous capacity, as I said, for caring, for consciousness, 
for creativity is unprecedented, really, in evolution. I mean, it's a matter of degree, of course. You know, other species have some of these characteristics. Surely, uh, there has to be a better possibility than the domination system. And discovering that there are resurgences of partnership periodically. And also, frankly, leaving behind some of the old categories and some of the old approaches. Because really, we cannot move forward uh, without that, is what I mean. When I first started to study, I started to look right, left, religious, secular, and it was like, what? You know, it just didn't work. So I hope that is somewhat of an answer. Is there somebody else? Yes, no? My goodness, I've left you speechless. <laughs> ah, there's somebody, there's a, a young woman over there. Do you want me to shout? No. Shout. Kirsten. Thank you so much for being here. It's really, I'm, I'm nervous to ask you a question because I find your um, brilliance overwhelming. But, but don't, I, don't. I Just wonder, um, I am an educator and also an administ administrator and a co-founder of a small secondary school in Floyd, Virginia, which is just about two and a half hours from here. And um, we've, we've created this school and we're building these new ways of thinking and being. Our mission is to foster deep connection with self, the community, and the land. So these valuing of feminine um, qualities. And it's hard. It's hard amidst um, old ways of thinking. It's almost like midwifing a new way of being while hospicing an old way of being. And I um, find myself feeling incredibly vulnerable. Often I find myself having to root down very deeply in my own um, connection to source and my own convictions. Um, but I walk the world vulnerable. And what? so I wonder if you might have words of encouragement for this person in Floyd, Virginia. Well, first of all, what is your name? My name is Jenny. Jenny, you are an agent for transformation. You are a very important part of this movement to move more to the partnership side. And what you're doing is so very, very important. So really, but don't expect that there won't be resistance. You know, the gender stereotypes uh, are so resistant, really. But at the same time, they're beginning to change. And so is the notion. You know, let me, let me go back, as I always do, to the European Middle Ages, right? And, and you know, St. Augustine, for example, which was you know, earlier than that, he said at his time that for uh, somebody to try to change their situation in life, it's like for a nose trying to be an eye. I mean, it was just completely out of the accepted way of thinking, uh, out of the way that the great authorities, you know, St. Augustine, you know, were saying the world is, and that's how it is. So all I can say to you is hang in there. And by the way, I have a book on education that I wrote called Tomorrow's Children. Um, and it's, the subtitle is a blueprint for partnership education in the 21st century. There's also a video done by the Media Education Foundation. It's not as good as a book because, you know, it's very condensed. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. But, I mean, they're wonderful, but, but you can only do so much, you know. And you may find that useful. But uh, just remember your worth to all of us. Thank you. I guess I'm leaving. Let me get a gift for you here. Okay. Oh, thank you. Okay, thanks, Bill. Well, Dr. Eisler, thank you so much for inspiring all of us. Talk about big picture thinking, right? I mean, do you all have a few things to think about when you go home tonight? Uh, but we, we really appreciate your, your lifting our, our spirits and our minds and getting us to think about what each one of us can do. And I think that's the message, and I'm so glad that you ask that question and, and the way in which you answered it is a reminder to all of us uh, that there's actually a great deal that we can do and we're part of a community uh, where we are constantly talking about wanting to be the change and how how is it that we can do that and how can we do it together and empower each other by working together so thank you so much
for your words of wisdom. What a treat it's been to have you with us. Thank and this is a so small much, token Karen. of our appreciation. Thank you. Yes, sir. Can you help me? Sure, sure, sure. Yes, I'll help you. Thank you. Well, I want to just say goodbye to all of you. I hope I will see some of you uh, still while I'm here tomorrow. And I hope to see you again. And I expect wonderful things from all of you. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. This video was produced by 